Thank you, Joel, for that over-the-top uh, uh, introduction, and thank you, Chancellor Thorpe and Valeria, and especially uh, Tom Lambeth. Um, I've given name lectures before, and usually they're in honor of somebody long dead. Uh, it's wonderful <laughs> to have the honoree uh, <laughs> lively and here in, uh, in person uh, to, uh, to honor. I'm also honored to have been asked uh, to replace the late Eleanor Ostrom, who had agreed to give this lecture before her unexpected death in June of this year. Uh, I know the committee knows about this. The others may not know that I was a replacement lecturer, but it is, it is a really uh, a top honor uh, to uh, replace Eleanor. Eleanor was an original thinker, a constructive maverick who made important contributions to economics from outside the mainstream of the discipline. She was a prolific researcher who inspired a generation of development economists around the world. She focused on how real people in many parts of the developing world set up their own rules for sustainable management of the common resources on which their lives depend. Many of us were delighted uh, when her contributions were recognized with the Nobel Prize in Economics. Now, my efforts have been more in the public arena, as uh, Joel noted at uh, considerable length, uh, and uh, more, uh, and have not yielded anything close to Eleanor's astonishing record of contributions to research and scholarship. Nevertheless, I think we have in common that we both worked at the intersection of economics and political science, and probably sociology as well. Uh, Eleanor was a professor of political economy, uh, and I now teach at a public policy school, not an economics department. That reflects my belief, which she shared, that the world's economic future depends not just on understanding how economic systems work or should work, but more importantly, on understanding how people think about their economic situation and that of others and how they act separately and in groups to improve their lives. And it's in that spirit that I want to talk to you uh, about uh, the question of reforming healthcare in the United States. Now, I entitled this lecture, Health Reform, When Will We Get It Right? And I want to give you two answers up front, which depend on how you interpret the question. First, if you mean, when will we create a complete health care system that does everything we want, the answer is clearly never. Health care is a big part of our economy. It's 18% of our GDP in the United States. Uh, and it's a highly dynamic sector experiencing rapid technological and organizational change that shows no sign whatever of slowing down. It's not the same system that it was a decade ago, much less a century ago. Medical interventions are much more effective than they used to be, and millions of people are living productive lives that would have been dead or disabled if they were forced to rely only on the care available a few decades ago. As this dynamism continues, it will require constant reevaluation in the way care is delivered and paid for. There will always be pressure to do more and more for patients, so we'll have to keep figuring out how much is enough or we will end up doing nothing but healthcare. People have deep emotions uh, about uh, healthcare policies because they affect their lives very intimately, and especially about the prospect of losing access to the healthcare system. As a consequence, how we manage and pay for healthcare is gonna be a constant focus of policymaking for the foreseeable future. The members of this audience who are planning careers in healthcare delivery or health administration or health policy are unlikely to be out of a job ever. We won't discover the perfect health system. 
At best, we will reach a broad consensus on the main features of a pretty satisfactory system and then continuing, uh, continue to adjust it around the edges, constantly trying to make it more effective, fairer, and less co costly to the combination of public and private entities that are paying the bill. Now, the, uh, my second answer may surprise you. <clears throat> Despite the strident rhetoric of the election campaign, I believe that, um, yes, I am short. I told you that before. <laughs> Thank you. Despite the strident rhetoric of the election campaign, I believe that Americans are now pretty close to consensus on such a system. I mean, one that will deliver effective care to almost everyone most of the time at sustainable cost. Now, that sounds pretty optimistic, especially if you've been listening to the dire accusations of our esteemed political candidates. But I submit that we currently have a pretty widespread agreement on keeping the basic structure of our health service delivery system, as well as pretty strong agreement on what needs to be done to improve it, What's lacking is the political atmosphere of constructive bipartisan dialogue that will assure that the necessary policy decisions actually get made. <clears throat> now, the high decibel exaggeration and antagonism in the political campaign makes it nearly impossible to believe that I'm right, to believe that we have a national consensus on anything, much less the sensitive, uh, a sensitive issue like healthcare. The two parties profess to believe that there is a wide gulf between their views of the role of government in society in general and in healthcare in particular. The shorthand is that the Democrats believe in collective responsibility on government actions while Republicans believe in individual responsibility and private action, that Democrats believe in enhancing regulation and that Republicans believe in freer markets. The parties claim that they are representing two different visions of the future of America and of healthcare. They say that voters have a clear choice between them, but in fact their actual proposals are often very hard to discern. The differences between the two parties are most evident when each is describing the terrible consequences of the things they believe the other party would do if elected. So if the parties really had such clear differences in basic philosophy, the upcoming elections would be an ideal time for a great national debate about healthcare policy. Candidates with different political philosophies could explain their concepts of what the government should do and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> with respect to the healthcare system. They could describe what they think the healthcare system could look, should look like in five or 10 years or 20 years, why they think that, how much they think it would cost, who would pay the bills, and how they propose to help us get there. Now, such a debate, reasoned, civil, well-informed, would be a great blessing and much needed evidence that our democracy is working well. But we aren't having that debate on health care or anything else, actually. Instead, we're having an ugly shouting match in which each side is trying to scare the voting public by depicting the other as advocates of drastic change that will wreck the American health system, alter the relationship between doctor and patient, threaten all the aspects of our healthcare system that people value most. Now, I think there's a simple reason why each side tries to scare the voters by exaggerating these terrible consequences of electing the other. If they did not, if they talked honestly about policies they actually favor, they would find that the differences between them narrowed quickly and compromises could actually be worked out. In the scare style of campaign rhetoric, Republicans describe President Obama's legislative achievement, the Affordable Care Act, 
as socialism, a huge federal power grab. They speak of death panels and, submitting to, uh, and substituting bureaucrats for doctors' judgment. They claim that the Affordable Care Act will raise health care costs for everyone and will throw small businesses into bankruptcy. It sounds really pretty terrible. Uh, they make fun of the length and complexity of the legislation itself. They vow to repeal it immediately if they win the election. Now, the visiting foreigner listening to Republican speeches might well assume that President Obama's health care law was radical and transformational. She might guess that legislation uh, uh, that was uh, drawing this kind of fire um, set up a national health service in which physicians and other care providers worked for the government, or perhaps that the president had established a national health insurance with universal coverage in which all the health payments came from the central government, or at the very least, uh, she would surmise that he had taken away state flexibility and centralized health decision-making in Washington. Well, actually, none of these things are true. The right adjectives for the Affordable Care Act are not radical and transformational. They're moderate and incremental. The Affordable Care Act, like the Massachusetts plan brokered by Governor Romney, which served as its model, was a compromise between liberals and conservatives. Romney was a Republican governor dealing with a Democratic legislature uh, in Massachusetts. If, he, if it hadn't been a compromise, it wouldn't have become law. It was designed uh, to expand health insurance coverage and constrain future costs without fundamentally altering the structure of American health care payments and delivery. The Affordable Care Act mandates that everyone have health insurance or face a penalty, a penalty which the Supreme Court points out is a tax well within the power of Congress to impose. It forbids health insurance companies uh, from denying coverage on the basis of pre-existing conditions or terminating coverage when a person gets sick. It sets up online markets or exchanges where individuals and small businesses can purchase insurance that meets a, sta a certain standard and establishes income-related subsidies to help people afford the coverage. Now, one of the criticisms that's absolutely true, the Affordable Care Act is a complicated law. It's not easily explained in sound bites, and the administration didn't do a very good job of explaining it. Its effectiveness will depend heavily on how it is implemented by numerous players, especially the states who have great flexibility in how they do it. But the complexity is not attributable to its radical nature. On the contrary, it's complex because its authors aspired to tweak our complicated, fragmented system of delivering and paying for health care without changing it in any drastic way takes a lot of words to write that tweaking into legislation. But the Republicans are not the only party resorting to exaggerations and scare tactics uh, in this election. Democrats claim that Republicans propose, quote, ending Medicare as we know it, turning it into a stingy voucher system that will force seniors to pay thousands of dollars for their health care. Ending Medicare as we know it, whatever that may mean, uh, sounds terrifying to anybody over 65, since seniors depend heavily on Medicare to finance their health care. This scare, stare, scare stuff is very real. I was uh, in uh, Buffalo recently uh, uh, talking to some participants in a health plan up there, independent health care, uh, including several seniors. and. They were really scared. They wanted to know, what are those people going to do in Washington uh, to uh, our Medicare uh, because we need it? Now, this claim uh, that, is, uh, is, uh, that we, the Republicans want to end Medicare as they know it is based on Congressman Paul Ryan's original proposal of several years ago to convert Medicare to a defined contribution plan in which seniors would choose among private plans and the growth of the government contribution would be capped and grow at a specific rate. 
Now, even Ryan's original plan can't really be described as a voucher, uh, but uh, his original plan phased in very slowly. Uh, it didn't even start for 10 years and affected only new beneficiaries after that. So it wouldn't have affected any current beneficiaries or people uh, uh, over 55 in any way. Nevertheless, it would have gradually phased out traditional Medicare and required seniors to choose a private insurance plan with a government subsidy. It would also have capped the rate of growth of the government contribution uh, to at an unreasonably slow rate and would likely have shifted over time substantially more costs to seniors. So I think it was fair to say that Ryan's original Medicare reform proposal would eventually end Medicare as we know it. But since his original proposal, Congressman Ryan has moved to the middle uh, quite drastically and joined with Democratic Senator uh, Ron Wyden from Oregon to craft a much more moderate reform that preserves traditional Medicare. The Ryan Wyden white paper is in fact very close to the proposal that uh, Senator Pete Domenici and I made in the context of our bipartisan uh, budget proposal. And needless to say, we thought that was a pretty reasonable plan. <laughs> the Democratic candidates, however, have continued to attack Ryan's original proposal because that can be made to sound so scary. They love to show the video made uh, a couple of years ago in the prior context of a lanky Ryan-like figure pushing sweet-faced granny in her wheelchair over the cliff. It's, it's a remarkable ad. I hope, I hope you've seen it. You go on YouTube and find it. Uh, not to be outdone, however, in the Medicare battle, the Republicans have now accused President Obama of cutting Medicare to fund that infamous socialist project that they call Obamacare. Uh, they count reductions in the subsidy for private plans under Medicare Advantage and efficiencies resulting from changing incentives to Medicare providers as Medicare cuts, and they say they will repeal them. Uh, so we now have the spectacle of each party appealing for the votes of seniors by claiming that the other side, if elected, will slash Medicare. Now, what does that tell you? It tells me that Medicare is an enormously popular program, not only with seniors, but also with their middle-aged children who don't want to be stuck with those bills. <laughs> Given that seniors are numerous and getting more so, and that we vote, there is absolutely no chance that elected politicians are going to slash Medicare. But they will take advantage of the opportunity to claim that the other guy will do so. Now, these exaggerations and misrepresentations on both sides leave the public frightened, confused, and believing that some drastic change in their health care is impending. These scare tactics may be effective vote-getters, but they're irresponsible, not only because of the unfounded fears that they create, but because they make it much more difficult for the politicians to come together after the election and work out the compromises that will improve the system. We're not having the responsible debate that we should be hearing, nor is it likely that huge changes in the structure of the health system will occur after the election, no matter who wins. No matter the outcome, we are likely to see very gradual changes over time. What we ought to be talking about is how to ensure that the incremental changes we make will move the system in the direction of improved service, broader coverage, and slower growth of costs. But you may wonder why I'm making the case for incremental changes. Isn't our system so messed up that we should blow it up and start over? Well, actually, I don't think so, although it certainly has its downsides. To begin with, the healthcare system is in, in America is incredibly expensive. Uh, as I said, we are devoting 18% of our total spending to health care, and that proportion is projected to keep rising to 20% by the end of the decade, and maybe more in the future. 
that's going to put pressure not just on the federal budget, but on state budgets, on company budgets, on everybody's budget. So we need to focus on it. And the huge expenditures have not given us a healthy population. We don't stack up well on the usual measures, such as longevity and infant mortality. Much of our poor record, most of it, I think, is attributable to lifestyle, to bad eating habits, to lack of exercise, to substance abuse, and not to health care. Nevertheless, it's not encouraging to know that we spend a third more on health care in relation to the size of our economy uh, than countries who are healthier than we are. Part of the high cost is waste, duplication, inefficiency, and fraud. Too much underutilized high cost equipment uh, is around in our medical establishment, as well as strenuous efforts to use the equipment more than necessary, just because it's there and it costs a lot. We do too many tests, there's too little coordination of care across specialties. There's plenty of evidence from careful studies of medical practice that medical practice varies enormously and that some providers, especially integrated health systems, deliver much better outcomes at lower costs than others. But you don't need careful studies. Anybody who's been a patient has their own anecdote uh, that they are happy to tell you uh, about uh, these kinds of wasteful expenditures. Despite high cost, however, uh, the system leaves millions without insurance coverage and consequently without adequate care. Candidate Romney pointed out on 60 Minutes that the uninsured are treated in emergency rooms, which is true, uh, but that's an expensive and unsatisfactory way to deliver care. Now, all of these negative allegations are true. Our health system is expensive, wasteful, uneven in quality, and leaves a lot of people out. But it also has many positive attributes that you don't hear very much about. We have extraordinary academic health centers on frontiers of science and patient care, with great examples right here in this area. Most people have health insurance that they are pretty satisfied with and have learned how to deal with. That's why the first rule of anyone trying to improve health insurance coverage is reassure people who have health coverage and like it, which is most people, that they aren't going to lose it. People have confidence in their health providers. They trust their doctors. This is demonstrable in poll after poll. There isn't a lot of trust in institutions or professions around these days. So the fact that most people trust their health providers is a big plus. The fact that most people are reasonably well satisfied with what they have explains why the Affordable Care Act had to involve incremental changes to pass. And it's also why the scare tactics are so effective on the campaign trail. If most people are pretty well satisfied with what they have, then the easiest way to get their vote is to convince them that the other side is out to destroy it. We learned that lesson in the Clinton administration, uh, uh, that uh, uh, a plan which was worked on very hard and was very incremental and was very uh, cognizant of uh, uh, how uh, uh, it uh, would uh, work out in the real world, uh, went down in flames uh, because the insurance industry was able, through the infamous uh, Harry and Louise ads that some of you may remember uh, to convince people that they were going to lose something that they cared very deeply about. The Obama administration did better in bringing all of the health establishment, insure, including the insurance companies, into the fold in formulating the, the plan, and you didn't have Harry and Louise ads this time around. Now, quite a few countries have more effective and, uh, and less costly healthcare delivery systems than we do, and it's tempting to ask, why can't we be like them? Well, we're not them. We have a different history and a different culture, and we have to start from where we are. Our history might have been different, but it wasn't. The framers of the Social Security uh, Act uh, in 1935 might have convinced President Roosevelt to include health care in the system. They thought of it. Uh, and we might now have a national single-payer system. 
But FDR thought health care was a bridge too far, and he was probably right. If the wage and price controllers in World War II had decided to control the price of total compensation rather than just cash wages, we might not have the big industrial companies offering health care to attract scarce walkers in the war. If early income tax regulations had applied the tax to total compensation rather than wages, which seems pretty logical, we might have had less generous health insurance and maybe less tendency to overtreat and overspend. But the result of these accidents was we got an employer-based uh, insurance system uh, that covers uh, most people and is most satisfactory uh, for big companies and high-wage workers. But the employer-based system left huge gaps that had to be filled by enacting Medicare and Medicaid, and one final gap that is filled by the Affordable Care Act, which also starts serious efforts to improve quality and mitigate uh, cost growth. Now, after the campaign dust settles, and it will, we will have the potential for ending the scare tactics and getting to work to improve the largely satisfactory structure that we have created. That will require Republicans to accept the Affordable Care Act as a plausible framework for expanding coverage to the uninsured, and it will require Democrats to admit that Medicare can be improved even by having traditional fee-for-service Medicare uh, compete with comprehensive private plans on a well-regulated exchange. So I think we have the makings here of a pragmatic solution. So let me end by describing why Medicare needs reform and how I think we should do it. Why re reform Medicare at all? Uh, I was saying it was a popular, successful program. Why not leave it, or leave it alone? Well, there are at least three powerful reasons. The one I come to because I'm a budgeteer uh, is the federal budget reason. The combination of the rising number of seniors and especially the rising cost of their care per beneficiary, per patient, per whatever, means that the cost of Medicare and also Medicaid will drive federal spending up faster than our economy can grow and faster than revenues can grow. So we have to do something to close uh, that gap, to slow the growth of, uh, cost, uh, uh, of costs in Medicare, and um, as well as finding more revenues somewhere. Second, Medicare exemplifies the weaknesses of our system. Uh, it's a largely fee-for-service system. Uh, the incentives in paying for individual services are that you encourage more services rather than higher value or higher quality or better outcomes. Uh, and we have, in, and we also, as a result, have very poor care con uh, coordination across specialties. And that matters a lot for older people, because uh, older people tend to have multiple chronic conditions uh, that need to be managed well. And third, Medicare is big enough to be a leader in moving the whole health system uh, to emphasize quality and outcomes rather than quantity. So there's hope uh, of uh, slowing uh, the growth of health care generally if Medicare takes the lead. Now, here we come back to the partisan divide. If in, but I think it's encouraging to note uh, what the parties, partisan as they are, are not arguing about. They're not arguing um, about uh, the necessity of controlling the cost so that Medicare doesn't grow much faster uh, than our uh, economy is growing. In fact, both the Republican plans and the President's plan hold the cost growth in Medicare uh, to uh, the GDP growth plus a half a percent. 
they started with GDP plus one. That's where we were in our uh, de Medici Rivlin plan. Uh, but then the president went us one better and said uh, GDP plus a half. Uh, and then the Republicans, said, who had started with one as well, said, okay, well, if the president's going to GD GDP plus a half, then we have to go to GDP plus a half. So you end up with a reasonable goal. We can't have this growing much faster than the GDP. Uh, and the same one across parties. They also agree on the direction of change, that it's got to be away from fee-for-service, there has to be more bundled payments, as they say, paying for a whole episode uh, of illness, or care, better yet, care for a patient for a whole period, uh, known as capitated plans. Comprehensive plans, uh, like Kaiser and Geisinger and many others, demonstrably get better results for lower cost, and there are lots of demonstrations and innovation projects uh, underway, I'm sure many of them, uh, in, uh, in this area. There is huge ferment uh, in the healthcare system trying to figure out how do we do this better, and uh, particularly how do we do the payment incentives better. So they aren't arguing about those things. The controversy is on how to get there. Democrats favor taking the results of successful innovation and implementation and uh, feeding it into Medicare by regulation. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which has uh, part of its complexity and length, uh, is describing multiple centers of uh, fostering innovation in payments and organization and approaches to care. Uh, it sets up the Independent uh, uh, Payments Advisory Board to sift through the results of this innovation and demonstration and propose uh, changes uh, in the Medicare payment system. Now, Republicans, by contrast, want to rely more on competition to allow the beneficiaries to choose among plans that are offering at least the same value as the fee-for-service Medicare and rely on competition to uh, get uh, the most uh, for, uh, for the buck uh, and uh, to uh, foster uh, the most cost-effective uh, plans. Now, when Pete Domenici and I sat down and said, what do we, how do we make sense of this? Uh, the, what we said was, why not both? Uh, preserve and strengthen traditional Medicare and keep the Affordable Care Act reforms allow beneficiaries to choose on an exchange uh, as well as stay if they want to uh, in traditional Medicare. Now, this is not a voucher plan, because if they choose a plan, uh, they, the plan itself gets a risk-adjusted payment. Uh, voucher generally means you ha everybody gets the same thing and we go shopping in the market. That is not the concept here, nor is it the concept in uh, Ryan Wyden. Uh, we would have the government contribution set by bidding on a regional exchange. We'd set the government contribution uh, at uh, the uh, second lowest bid on the exchange. You could do it other ways. Uh, but if the cumulative uh, contribution, government contribution over the years was rising faster than GDP plus whatever, you'd have to do something. We suggested a means-tested uh, premium, but you could do it. Uh, well, you could do it other ways. So what I'm saying is I think there are the elements of a good bipartisan compromise uh, on the table being actively uh, discussed, uh, and that we're part way there already. Uh, the uh, proposal that I've just described can actually be seen as uh, quite incremental in that you could describe it as an improvement to Medicare Advantage, which also already uh, serves a quarter of Medicare's beneficiaries. My point is that the apparent partisan divide is not as deep as it looks. Uh, we need to keep the basic outlines of the structure uh, that we have, improve it, improve the Affordable Care Act, implement the exchanges, uh, push incentive changes, compromise on Medicare reform, and then all sides can declare victory and move on. 
Uh, but as I said at the beginning, it's not ever going to be over. But with any luck, we get beyond this election rhetoric and we say, what do we really need to do? And we find we've got a pretty good system. Let's improve it around the edges and make it work. Thank you. you have your chance to ask questions, get clarification. For those over in Haynes Hall, just have an usher bring your questions that are written to Pete Andrews, he's, who's here, and he will sort through them. So we have some microphones, and if you do have a question, we ask that you speak into the mic. And uh, here's a person with a mic. Where's the question? There. You have a history of um, dealing with, bi with bipartisan negotiations, and you said that that was the first step to actually um, making health care something that both parties could talk about and get to an actual reform. What is the first step um, to sort of crossing that bridge and, and getting those um, both parties to, to look at compromise? What is, the, what is the first step to getting a uh, bipartisan conversation going uh, and getting both parties working together? Well, it's first is getting the election over. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then I think um, since there have been several efforts already to do this, including the two I mentioned, Simpson Bowles and Domenici Rivlin, on which I served, but they're not the only ones. Uh, there are... Uh, side conversations going on uh, in Washington, uh, around Capitol Hill, mostly in the Senate, I regret to say, not as much in the House, that won't surprise you, uh, but uh, uh, that are talking about many of these things and uh, uh, already. Now, the forcing action is going to be this terrible thing known as the fiscal cliff, which we never should have allowed to develop, uh, which will occur at the end of this calendar year, New Year's Eve, uh, when all of the uh, Bush tax cuts and the Obama tax cuts expire, uh, and this terrible thing called the sequester, uh, which is a mindless across the board spending cut, whatever you think about government spending, you wouldn't do it program by program at the same uh, uh, percentage rate. Uh, when all of those things and a bunch of other stuff uh, come into uh, play. So the Congress has got to do something about that situation, which it created itself uh, before the end of the year. And I think there's hope uh, that uh, the parties will sit down together and negotiate uh, a compromise on the larger budget problem and within that a compromise on health care. Um, that, that's where I think the first step is. Over here. If you're at our end of the communications net, what you've just been saying sounds devastatingly optimistic. We haven't heard anything that optimistic from people in a very long time about the possibilities. Is that optimism shared by your fellows in the public policy community? You know, the folks that you talk to. I know you're talking to politicians, but generally speaking up there. Oh, I don't think anybody admits to being very optimistic these days because they're mostly listening to the campaign rhetoric and they have seen the repeated failures uh, over the last uh, several years. I mean, the year 2011 was a history of, of failure all the way through uh, uh, to come to bipartisan compromise. We had first what I thought was a presidential mistake, the failure of the president to pick up the Simpson-Bowles uh, uh, pl plan and uh, try to work out something with the Congress, uh, and uh, the failure of the negotiations between the president and Speaker Boehner. Uh, the devastating horror of the, the uh, debt ceiling debacle. Um, and then finally, the, the last hope, the super committee, which we all thought might do it. Uh, but I think 
this is my optimism, uh, I think that uh, some of the reasons for that failure, the several failures, were that they've realized that going around the regular committees of Congress is not a very good idea. They need to craft something which will bring in the actual members uh, and uh, that are in charge of making these decisions, uh, so-called regular order, and there's a lot of work going on on how you might do that in the lame duck session and moving into the next year. Uh, the public policy community, I don't know, academics are always kind of pessimistic. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, any honest reading of the, of the uh, success so far would lead you to extreme pessimism. Uh, but I think at some point we've got to come to our senses. Uh, we can't allow gridlock to continue, and there are a lot of people who realize that. Dr. Rivlin, I'm both a provider and a consumer. I've never looked upon the insurance companies as being a free market. And I think one of the biggest concerns is that they have all the control. Uh, for example, uh, last week it was announced that I think eight of the ten of the most popular used Medicare Part D is in dog companies have, are raising their rates for Medicare recipients next year between 10 and 20 percent. And I think one of the concerns with the Republican concept is who's controlling the insurance companies. Um, yeah, there are a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of mistrust of a lot of institutions, including insurance companies. Um, two points on that. Uh, one is um, the kind of plan that I'm talking about now, who knows whether this will get legislated, but the kind of plan that I am talking about uh, as the uh, compromise on Medicare um, is, uh, com is, involves uh, a competition on a very well-regulated exchange. Uh, and uh, that, uh, uh, how, how you do that is a question, but um, it's the same question you have in the exchanges in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, anomaly of this situation is that the parties are on opposite sides with respect to exchanges, depending on which part of the, of the health care system you're talking about. Uh, the Democrats uh, put exchanges, which was basically first a Republican idea, in the Affordable Care Act and uh, are trying to, uh, to make it work. Uh, many of them would have preferred to have a public option competing with the private sector plans on, uh, uh, on the exchanges. But if you come to Medicare, we've already got the public option. Uh, that, uh, uh, that exists. And uh, we're, we're only talking about how you uh, have uh, that in competition uh, with uh, private sector plans. We're also not talking about competition among insurance companies. We're talking about health plans would provide the same coverage. Um, so I think uh, there, there are a lot of answers to this, uh, but uh, it, it is sort of amusing to, uh, I've teased Paul Ryan about this, why are you so against exchanges in the Affordable Care Act, uh, but you want them in the Medicare program? Uh, well, he can't actually explain that. We have a question from uh, Haynes. Good. And it's sort of a follow-on to what you've just been talking about. And that is, uh, you've talked about money uh, moving toward a pay for quality rather than fee for service system. But services do cost money for the doctor's office, for the hospital. How does fee for quality of care work? And who implements the policies and makes decisions about care? Well, this is a big work in progress. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, the answers are not very clear yet. But uh, as many of you know, we're working on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, one of the things that uh, is built into that is accountable care organizations, uh, which would have to produce uh, uh, measures of uh, what uh, the outcomes of their patient care were uh, and uh, a compensation 
uh, would be uh, uh, based in part on those measures. Now, this is a long, there's a long way to go here, uh, but the concept of paying for quality is not one of the divisions between the parties. Everybody's for it. It's just a question of figuring out how to do it. I get the impression that you don't think that single pair would ever work here. Is that uh, just based on your speech today? But um, it depends what you mean by single payer. Medicare is a single payer system. Uh, it's just one that pays on uh, a basis that hasn't worked out terribly well in terms of controlling uh, the uh, uh, the cost. Um, but I think, uh, uh, no, I, I agree with you, or, or I, uh, you, I agree with your implication of what I said. Uh, I do not think that uh, we will move to a singer payer system for everybody. Um, as I said, there might have been a time in our history where we might have done that, uh, but we didn't. And um, I think people find that scary. That's, uh, it's not going to happen because people feel that if this is a radical new thing that uh, I'm going to lose the coverage I already have and it's going to go to some big government thing, uh, that's not one you can defend and win. So I think, uh, I think that's right. The, the, it's interesting to me that over the period that I've been working on this, uh, the recent period, there were earlier ones, uh, two things have dropped out of the conversation. One is single payer, uh, and the other is the extreme versions of the market solution that uh, many uh, conservatives were, were peddling for a while. I think it's been realized that um, having uh, individuals um, choosing at the mo at the point of service uh, what provider they wanted to go to or what hospital they want to go to is ridiculous and wouldn't control costs. Uh, the bulk of the costs are in a very expensive episodes. They aren't controlled by the patient. They are controlled by the protocols of the hospital wherever you are, uh, and. Uh, uh, it's not a situation in which consumer choice can be very operational. So I think that's dropped out of the conversation. Competition among plans, but not at the point of service. Uh, and single payer is kind of dropped out for the reasons that I stated, which are largely um, political, but I think they're right. I, it's hard to imagine that we could implement in this country, which is so big and diverse, uh, a, a single system of paying for health care that would work very well. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the state's role in, in an ideal plan and also would you say you talked about the Massachusetts uh, plan from Romney that it would be possible for the states to uh, act as basically a lab and to start some of these programs before the federal government because you know States might not be as partisan, might not be as, it might be a little bit easier to pass these plans there first. And in an ideal federal plan, what would the state's role be? So kind of two questions connected. Well, uh, the state's role is very heavy right now in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that was um, uh, built into the act uh, from the beginning uh, that uh, states could set up their own exchanges. Uh, now, Massachusetts did it, and it's the only living example uh, so far, and it seems to be working quite well. Uh, but uh, the, uh, about a third of the states are, uh, have, have set up exchanges already or are act, or, you know, about to have, have them uh, uh, more or less operational. Um, and uh, others haven't, but that's the the principle of the uh, of the act uh, is uh, to uh, uh, allow state flexibility in uh, how they how they carry it out, um, and um, uh, I think that's a pretty good idea. But then you have the problem of states who say, "Wait, we don't want to have any part of this." We uh, and uh, we're not going to play. Uh, the Affordable Care Act did say 
that you can't deprive your your citizens of this uh, uh, of the benefits of this act. Uh, if the states don't do it, uh, the federal government will. Um, you did an eloquent job of describing the two versions of the uh, Ryan plan, and I thank you. But often in the campaign, Romney has distanced himself from Ryan, who of course is running for vice president. What can you tell us about Romney's plan? Or is it different? Very from little, uh, because he hasn't told us very much. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that he's distanced himself on the Medicare plan, uh, uh, although nobody's been very specific. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what Romney's uh, plan uh, is. That, though he's been more specific about that than about anything else. He said that he uh, in, was, he liked Ryan Wyden. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the words were, but he has certainly conveyed that uh, this general solution uh, was uh, something he was, uh, he was for. Um, he said almost nothing about the, uh, the rest of the healthcare system, the people under 65, except that he would repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act and he would repeal the savings uh, in Medicare <clears throat> that uh, uh, were uh, in the in the uh, Affordable Care Act, um, and those were actually in the in the baseline that Ryan used. So they got into a slight uh, embarrassment uh, over over that. But he hasn't said what he would substitute. Uh, and recently, he's kind of backtracked. He wouldn't repeal the whole thing, only part of it. Uh, but I don't know what's going on there. It's a real. I mean, you have to feel for Romney. Uh, he was governor of Massachusetts. He worked out this plan with a Democratic legislature. Uh, it uh, was a good plan. He was proud of it. And then all of a sudden he found himself running uh, in Republican primaries where he couldn't admit that anything that the government ever done, did was a good thing. Uh, so he had to back away from it. Uh, or he felt he did, and now he doesn't know exactly what to say, I think. We'll have one more question, and then uh, we'll have an informal oh. Oh. Okay, okay, you have the mic. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned that the way in which we deliver and pay for healthcare as a nation is unique, and that's what works best for us. Um, this being so, from what healthcare systems in the developed world do you feel we can best learn from as examples for our healthcare system? Uh, what healthcare systems in the developing world can we best learn from? In the developed world? Um, <clears throat> well, I think the Canadian system works quite well, uh, but for reasons I explained earlier, uh, I don't think we're about to do that uh, because uh, it, we have just had this very strong anti-government uh, tradition that I think will keep us uh, from doing a, uh, a Canadian type system or a British type system uh, for, uh, for, for a long time. Uh, but what I've, I'm not a student of, of uh, European systems, but I did spend some time in France about four or five years ago um, at a time when they were having a big discussion about their plan. They have a single-payer system. They have all the same problems that we have. Uh, they have upward pressure on cost. They have an aging population. Uh, and uh, what, what do you do about it within the uh, single-payer system? And I was actually sort of amused to see that the things that were being discussed were exactly the same things we were talking about here. Higher co-pays. Uh, Sarkozy, who was then the candidate, uh, pro proposed higher copays and uh, stronger gatekeepers, and he had to withdraw the copays because that wasn't very popular. Uh, so uh, the same the same problem uh, really arises. How do you incent the providers uh, to do the best they can, and how do you control costs? Uh, whether it's a, sing, uh, a single payer system or a multiple payer system, it doesn't make very much difference. The, the problems are the same. I said one more, but I 
think we had two hands at the same time. So. Fairness. Okay. Fairness. Yeah. <laughs> yes, my, my question is, it seems from your presentation that the policy community believes that if we can resolve our political differences and come up with a more rational system uh, through a series of thoughtful compromises, that we can uh, cut the cost of uh, the growth of care to acceptable levels. Uh, but the question I have is, can we really do that without, over the long term, some people getting less care or some providers getting less money or us having to put more money into the system to achieve uh, a more balanced uh, revenue cost picture? Well, one of the advantages of our wasteful system uh, is there's a lot of room for improvement. And uh, I think some of the things that are being worked on and the evidence that you can deliver good care in some settings for much less uh, is pretty persuasive. Uh, so that uh, we'll always have upward pressure on the cost. Uh, but uh, we will certainly, uh, uh, there's certainly a lot of waste to be squeezed out. Uh, does that mean that some people uh, will get less care? I don't think so. I think we can do this in a way that improves care for everybody and we're actually now, if we implement the Affordable Care Act, uh, edging toward a system that uh, covers uh, everybody more adequately. But. Uh, there's the question of do the providers make less money? Yes, probably. Uh, if you examine the differences, why is it that uh, the uh, best European systems deliver uh, very good care for less money? Why is it? Well, it's partly their doctors don't make as much and they don't have as many specialists. They use uh, general uh, 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 what we would call general practitioners much more heavily and they don't make as much money. Uh, and uh, so probably over time, uh, the, uh, uh, if we evolve in the direction that I think a lot of people are thinking, uh, it will be encouraging uh, people not to, uh, uh, doctors not to go into so such specialized medicine and they'll earn less money in the end, uh, but uh, not less. But it won't go up as much as it otherwise would. And that's a very important thing because, and the politicians are very careless about saying we'll cut health costs. Nobody's talking about cutting anything. They're talking about cutting rates of growth. And uh, that's, that's important. Uh, there's no way we're going to spend less. Uh, and there's no way we're probably ever going to spend less than the 20% of our GDP if we get there. Uh, but we can level off and not grow so fast and uh, cover a lot more people in the process. Thank you.